Today we're going to talk about unemployment, reemployment, and income security, or income insecurity, uh, as the, the case might be. So let's start with some, uh, something to get our attention focused on that question. We're hauling 20,000 pounds of freight down the Florida Turnpike in a self-driving robotic truck. It's been retrofitted with a self-driving kit made by Starsky Robotics. Kartik Tiwari and Stefan seltz Oxmacher founded the company in 2016. We think that sometime towards the end of the year, uh, we could be doing this run without a person behind the wheel. This year? Yeah. Self-driving trucks this year? Yep. And if it's not his company, it might be Otto, whose truck made headlines last October by driving itself across Colorado to deliver a shipment of beer. Otto is owned by Uber, which has also been testing self-driving taxis in Pennsylvania and Arizona. But here's the thing. Once our trucks and taxis drive themselves, what will happen to the people who used to do those jobs? In the U.S., that's 180,000 taxi drivers, 600,000 Uber drivers, and 3.5 million truck drivers. We really need to start to think very seriously about this. Martin Ford is the author of Rise of the Robots. This is it. He says driverless cars and trucks are just the beginning of a wave of automation that will threaten millions of jobs in every industry at once, like America's nearly 5 million store workers. The cashiers are totally gone. You're going to end up with the equivalent of a Walmart with, you know, a handful of employees. You scale that out, and that's just extraordinarily disruptive. You name an occupation, and there's somebody considering a robot to take it over. Look how delicate. Perfect every time. At Zoom Pizza in Silicon Valley, four specialized robots help make the pizza. Eventually, the company plans to replace the remaining humans on the line, too. The common wisdom is that robots primarily threaten repetitive blue-collar jobs. Not so, says Martin Ford. We're seeing dramatic advances in, in the area of computers, analyzing tumors, recognizing medical scans, mammograms, and being able to find disease. We're seeing, you know, algorithms move into areas like journalism, for example. You know, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Certainly not journalism. Oh, yeah. Ab absolutely <laughs> journalism. Um, by one account, every 30 seconds, there's a news story published on the web or maybe in a newspaper that's machine generated. Algorithms are even threatening the masters of the universe. Earlier this year, BlackRock, the world's largest money manager, announced that it's laying off dozens of human stock pickers and replacing them with robots. By 2025, across the financial industry, Artificial intelligence is expected to replace 230,000 human workers. Bring on the disruption that is automation. Alicia Wiesel is the chief information officer at Goldman Sachs. The company now hires nearly as many computer engineers as financial workers. A quarter of these people aren't traders. They're coders, writing software to automate the routine grunt work of employees all across the company. According to one recent study, 47% of American jobs could be lost to automation in the next 20 years. I'm sure 20 years from now, almost no one will be driving a vehicle. Young people are forward-looking, and they say, well, I guess I'm not going to have a driving career, so I'm not going to go there. Well, except that these young people might think, well, maybe I'll go into retail, but that's also going away. Well, maybe I'll be a chef, but that's also going away. Well, maybe I'll be a paralegal, but that's also going away. So let's do the following thought exercise. It's the year 1900, and... 40% of all employment is in agriculture, right? And so some twerpy economist from MIT teleports back in time to Farmer Pogue here and says, 100 years from now, only 2% of people will be working in agriculture. What do you think the other 38% of people are going to do? Well, I wouldn't know. We, we'd say, oh, search engine optimization, <laughs> you know, uh, health and wellness, software and mobile devices. Most of what we do barely existed 100 years ago. In other words, just because we can't predict what we'll be doing doesn't mean we'll be doing nothing. So there you see the, the great debate that is now being fostered among economists and others about the likely effects of automation. On the one hand, there are people who are saying this is a fundamentally new 
development that these that essentially all employment is going away and there's going to be nothing for people to do. Uh, on the other hand, you see people say, well, a, as was said at the end of, in the last part of that clip, in, uh, in 1900, if people had had to speculate where everybody who was going to be put out of work in the agricultural economy was going to wind up, they wouldn't have had any, any idea as to where they would go. And so just as all kinds of industries have emerged, um, over the course of the last century that nobody could have dreamed of at the beginning of it, uh, so the same thing will happen in the next century and there will be all kinds of new em employment, uh, life has more imagination than us and uh, people will innovate in new ways with techniques we can't even consider. And that is certainly going to be an open question not a debate we would settle in this course, uh, let alone whether anybody else can settle it. Uh, what is clear, though, as I've emphasized in previous lectures, is that the, the idea of long-term employment security has gone away. And so our agenda today, is whether people are going to ever uh, get new employment or they're going to work through a series of, of up to 13 or 15 or 20 jobs over the course of a lifetime, the idea of a continuous stream of income from one job that people get upon finishing their formal uh, K through 12 or perhaps K through college education has gone away. And so our agenda today is how to think about um, the best responses to endemic and permanent wage insecurity. But I want to do it with one eye on uh, last Tuesday's lecture. We want to think not only about the economics and the ethics of what we want to uh, consider as desirable policies, but also the political feasibility. Where, where is it likely that we can build coalitions to actually implement the sorts of policies that might be desirable and then find the resources for them, uh, the, the proximate goals to make sure they, they move uh, steadily forward, the entrenchment to stop them from being undone, and the uh, leadership to put together and hold together the coalitions to do that along with uh, a moral narrative uh, that will be compelling to people and can head off potential blocking coalitions. So we want to keep all of that in mind. And I'm going to talk about four different topics in connection with this. The first is, a, is an idea that has actually been around since the 1970s. Um, and this is the idea of UBI that used to stand for uh, unconditional basic income, uh, now refers to the idea of universal basic income. But uh, this is the idea that people should be given some kind of uh, financial grant unrelated to work, unrelated to employment. Second, we'll focus on minimum wages and uh, the political pressure uh, to put up minimum wages in response to employment uh, uh, wage stagnation and, and the relative decline of wages that we have talked about uh, at some length. Um, then we will look at um, something called the EITC, the Earned Income Tax Credit, um, which is a kind of wage subsidy that has also, be, be, also emerged in the 1970s and gets a lot less press, but we, in my forthcoming book with Michael Grath, think is much more interesting and promising. And then finally, we will talk about the history and prospects for, for transitional assistance. There have been programs um, since the Kennedy administration in this country for, to provide people with transitional assistance um, in uh, moving from one job to another that have not fared very well, and we'll talk about why and what the prospects for them might be. So let's start by um, going at, first to the idea of uh, an unconditional or universal basic income. 
Well, there is now in Europe and beyond more interest in the idea of an unconditional basic income than there has ever been in the history of mankind. Why? Some people say it's because we predict autom more automation, robotization. There is some truth in that, but uh, this is combined with uh, greater uh, uncertainty, greater doubts about uh, the feasibility, the desirability of what has always been offered as the central answer to the problem of unemployment by both the right and the left, namely growth. And so if we think that growth is either continued growth is either not possible or not desirable and that anyway it hasn't lost the problem of unemployment despite all the growth we've had, then it's high time to think about something else. Think seriously about an unconditional basic income, a floor instead of a safety net, something that would be a central element in any project for a free society and a sane economy. So that is Philippe von Parais. He is a Belgian political philosopher who has been championing, championing this idea uh, for some time. He runs something called the Basic Income European Network, since renamed the Basic Income Earth Network, was originally formed in 1986. The, the book in which he uh, developed this idea was called Real Freedom for All. Uh, it's the subtitle, What If Anything Can Justify Capitalism, which he published over two decades ago. And he's a Rawlsian political philosopher. You might call him a sort of left Rawlsian. Um, and he, he took off from the core insight in John Rawls's work, uh, in R John Rawls's work, A Theory of Justice. And th this is a, so it, it, in the first instance, is a philosophical argument for the idea that people, every, every human being uh, in a society should be entitled to an unconditional basic income. And so what Rawls did and what was considered to be revolutionary and is at the analytical core of his theory of justice was he said, well, think about the differences in cap capabilities between us. Some people say, you know, differences in IQ, for example, um, some people say it's all about genetics. Some people say it's all about environment. And they usually the, there are these big ideologically charged fights. Are the, you know, is, it, is it genetics? Is it not? Are the IQ differences between different ethnic groups provoked? You know, uh, Charles Murray and others uh, got into these hugely uh, charged ideological fights over this question in the in uh, recent decades. Rawls says, you know, if the differences between us are due to nature, well, then it's luck in the genetic lottery. If the differences between us are due to nurture, then it's luck in where you happened to be born. Either way, it's morally arbitrary. After all, you didn't choose uh, to have the genes that you've got, and you didn't choose to grow up in the country, never mind the family that you uh, found yourself in. You're either born into or perhaps adopted into. It's nothing to do with you. And so the debate about nature versus nurture as to what people are entitled to is really beside the point. And this, this is sometimes called luck egalitarianism because um, Rawls made an argument on that basis for the proposition that all the differences between us are morally arbitrary and we th should think about principles of justice that uh, take account of that moral arbitrariness. And he developed his, his own theory, which need not concern us here, based the, the, the bottom line of which was that um, inequalities can only be justified if they benefit the least advantaged people in the society. Um, and he thought he, that that would uh, trickle up a kind of Keynesian story, if you like, and that would benefit everyone. So Fun Perez had a slightly different take on this, this Rawlsian insight. He said what it means is that everybody should be entitled to an unconditional basic income at the highest sustainable level. 
be up to political economists to figure out what that is, but that's what we should all be entitled to. It should have nothing to do with our capacities to work at different levels of productivity. It should be independent of work. And so this was the egalitarian case for as high as sustainable and unconditional basic income. So uh, this, this de generated a huge debate among philosophers. Nobody paid a great deal of attention to it outside of the academy. And indeed, a fatal objection was launched uh, eventually by a philosopher called Susan Hurley um, in a critique of Rawls in which she said, well, you know, um, th this is, a, I put the quotation up on the board, but the gist of it is the following. She said, well, it may be true that the differences among us are morally arbitrary, whether it's genetic luck or luck in uh, the lottery of where we happen to be born, and so uh, we, no one is in, in some natural sense entitled to what they produce. But why should that create any presumption in favor of an equal distribution? It could just as easily uh, create some different presumption in, in some people's minds. And so the, the gist of Hurley's point was, actually, it doesn't justify any distributive presumption, uh, including perhaps that we're entitled uh, to the fruits of our individual labor. I'll come back to that. So it no more justifies a presumption in favor of equality than a presumption in favor of any other distribution. Uh, a case will have to be made, uh, and, there, and so it doesn't follow sort of in, in any pristine analytical sense that we should be entitled to uh, have a distribution that works to the benefit of the least advantaged in Rawls's case, or in von Perez's case, it doesn't follow in any uh, analytically tight sense that everybody should be entitled to the highest possible sustainable income. Uh, and so the, the, the normative case for this egalit strong egalitarian presumption it sort of goes away. Now, you might say, well, that's, that's all true, but particularly in light of what we've been discussing in this course, there might still be a powerful case for a universal basic income, not, perhaps not the highest sustainable universal basic income, but nonetheless, it's something that would uh, give everybody a cushion. It would enable people uh, to deal with the vicissitudes of employment markets and the vagaries of um, secure jobs that we, that we have been attending to. And indeed, one of the presidential candidates uh, who was uh, just made it into the debates last night is a strong proponent of a UBI, so let's give him a little more airtime than he got last night. And you're running for president. Uh, based on this issue of UBI, universal basic income, what is a universal basic income? What is your plan? Universal basic income is a policy where every member of a society, let's say every American adult, receives a certain amount of money to meet his or her basic needs every month. And my plan, the freedom dividend, is that every American adult would receive $1,000 per month, free and clear. $1,000 per month, every American over the age of... 18. 18. Uh, this, to a lot of people, is going to sound like a completely nutso idea. So, just to be clear, has the U.S. ever, has any government body in the U.S., existing or past, ever done anything like this? Well, a law essentially identical to this passed the House of Representatives in 1971 under Richard Nixon. Martin Luther King was for it, Milton Friedman was for it, and a thousand economists signed a letter saying this would be great for the economy and society. And then a number of years later, Alaska passed something identical to this in the form of the petroleum dividend, where everyone in Alaska today receives between one and $2,000 a year, no questions asked, from the petroleum fund. And th if you think about this for a moment, Alaska is a deep red conservative state. And the Republican governor made this case to the Alaskan people. He said, who would you rather get the oil money, the government who's just going to screw it up, or you, the Alaskan people? And the Alaskans said, us. And then now the petroleum dividend is wildly popular. It has increased uh, children's, or has improved children's health and nutrition. It has created thousands of jobs, and no one can touch it. And that's been in effect for 36 years. So if you think about it, what is the oil of the 21st century? 
The oil of the 21st century is data, AI, autonomous vehicles, and advanced technologies. And that's how we're going to pay for a freedom dividend for all, all Americans. I want everyone here to reflect, why is Donald Trump our president today? And the reason why Donald Trump is our president today is this. We automated away 4 million manufacturing jobs in Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Missouri, Iowa, all of the swing states that he needed to win. And now we're about to do the same thing to millions of retail jobs, call center jobs, truck driving jobs, fast food jobs, which are unfortunately the four most common jobs in the economy. Now, I have many friends in Silicon Valley who are working on this who know full well that this trend is about to accelerate. So if we don't wake up and start implementing meaningful solutions to the fact that we are going through the greatest economic and technological transition in the history of the world, then we are doomed to much, much worse than Donald Trump. So that, that is Andrew Yang's um, platform. Um, and he makes some very, very convincing points. And if you think about it, um, if you have a, a universal basic income, it, it can also have a, a desirable effect for, on um, relations within firms. Um, and this, this goes back to our old friend Albert Hirschman. If you think about, um, if you think about let a world so, um, where there's a, a, a continuum from um, what we might call a Dickensian nightmare, where there's no social support of any kind for people who lose their jobs, and at the other end is surface paradise. I use the term surface paradise because uh, one of von Paris's famous lines was that even surfers should be paid. Um, so surface paradise is a, pure, you know, Juan uh, Paraiso's utopia. Um, so the, you, should, you could then think that um, the, the, the power relations within the workplace um, are greatly affected by where you are on this continuum. Because if you are living near a Dickensian nightmare, uh, where the costs of losing your job are extremely high, and your employer says to you, I wouldn't mind a cup of coffee, you're going to scurry off and get that cup of coffee and come scurrying back quickly. Whereas if you uh, are closer to the surface paradise and you could walk away from your job, you might say, well, go get your own coffee, right? And so there was a thought, there's, there was a, a, a big literature in the 80s and 90s, which basically said that uh, if you, rather than trying to have the government produce more democracy within firms to protect workers from um, exploitative practices, it would be better to just decrease the exit costs, uh, and, then, and then they'll have to treat you better. Just as, for example, uh, at Yale, um, in 1992, the, the Supreme Court ruled that uh, compulsory retirement uh, was illegal, uh, age discrimination. And so the interaction of tenure and the abolition of compulsory retirement created a huge problem for universities. And until that time, uh, universities had treated emeritus faculty uh, with contempt. They had pretty much ignored them. Uh, once you were out of here, you were out of sight, out of mind. Um, in order to, to uh, get them to leave, uh, they, you know, superannuated people like me, they had to start coming up with much better retirement packages to reduce the exit costs from employment. They had to, they had to start treating emeritus faculty better. They built a building where they could have offices, they, they gave them email accounts and so on and, and so forth. So if your exit costs are very high, you're much more vulnerable uh, within a firm than if your exit costs are low. And so um, some people even argued, and I was one of them, that you might be able to get business support for a much more robust social wage, giving people benefits that are un not tied to their work, if, if, you, if you, on the other hand, also promised business less regulation. So you'd say, well, if, if, um, if 
there were debates about this, for example, in the European Union, that in countries that didn't supply a lot of workers' protection, maybe the social chapter should provide stronger, um, un stronger uh, appeals processes when workers are abused and so on. And, and the idea was that since what business wants is flexibility at the plant level, you could try and get business support for a coalition to increase social wages, the quid for the quo being that, um, that they would get less regulation in the workplace, it would be easier for them to lay off people because it would be less catastrophic for the people, and so on. Uh, and so I and others pushed these kinds of arguments. The difficulty with them was political, for the most part, that because uh, of the declining power of labor anyway, the, no, the notion that business had any incentive to get behind these proposals was pie in the sky. And so they were still born. Uh, and it's very difficult to make the case today. Um, so it might nonetheless be true that we should think that UBI's now is an idea, his time has come. But why does it get so little support? Now you can get polls, you can, you can run polls where you can get 48% of the American public to say they're in favor of it, but they're standalone polls that don't say anything about the costs or how it would be funded. Um, and if you look at efforts to actually produce it, you find that people are very resistant to this idea of writing checks to, to anyone that are completely unrelated to work. Why might that be? Why might that be? Work, there's a work ethic. So what is a work ethic? We must bootstrap ourselves up. This idea that people get something for nothing uh, or that they haven't done, uh, they haven't made the requisite effort is is extremely strong. Uh, it's something that uh, political theorists sometimes call the workmanship ideal, this idea that uh, when you, you working for something creates, um, you, you know, it creates an entitlement over it, and because you know that, it gives you the incentive uh, to work hard. And indeed, if you go back to the, the John Rawls's argument that I mentioned at the outset, he realized not surprisingly, he was a very intelligent guy, he realized that his moral arbitrariness argument was sort of at war with the work ethic, right? Because if you say nature, nurture, doesn't matter, uh, how, you know, however you got your skills and capacities, um, it's all morally arbitrary, you don't deserve, none of you Yale students deserve to be here, right? There's no reason, you, you know, you just got lucky. And you want to say, you know, no, I worked hard to get to Yale. And so, so Rawls had a kind of cop-out um, that uh, he said, well, yeah, the, the distribution uh, of our capacities and skills is morally arbitrary, but the, what we choose to do with them is not. So if, if one person decides to work hard every day uh, and he's got lots of you know, Protestant work ethic, and the other one sits on the couch watching uh, ESPN all day, then the one who work, choose, even if they, you know, they have the same capacities, the one that chooses to work harder is deserving of their differential benefit. But of course, you know, that and, and $2.75 might get you a seat on the New York City subway because the capacity to use your capacities is also morally arbitrary, arbitrarily distributed. You know, if one person uh, has uh, parents who pump the work in ethic into them a mile a minute and uh, gets, you know, teaches them, sits and does homework with them every night for 15 years uh, and so on, uh, that's very different from a parent who's maybe in an alcoholic daze uh, ignoring their children, and so the 
one child grows up with the capacity to use their capacities much better than the next person. And indeed, maybe uh, the capacity to stick at things also even has a genetic component. Some people uh, may be genetically more able to focus. We, you know, all the research on attention deficit disorder and all of that. Um, so, you know, Rawls's answer is, is, is just a way of avoiding the problem that he's identified. And, and so here's the funny thing about Rawls, and when I teach this in political philosophy classes, we spend a lot more time on it. But what you find um, is almost nobody can see anything wrong with Rawls's moral arbitrariness argument, except for his cop-out, which any smart student can shred in a matter of minutes. Um, but nobody really wants to go all the way with it because it threatens the, the very idea of individual responsibility, right? Because how can you hold anyone responsible for anything if even our capacity to behave responsibly is distributed in morally arbitrary ways? And so even though it is true that our capacities to do things are distributed in morally arbitrary ways, people don't like to live with that implication. Even if it's true that some people got a lot of help from whoever it is, Sunday school teachers, that other people didn't get, uh, and uh, more, more diligent parents and so on, people do not want to live with the implications of that. And if you want a political illustration of that, think back to the firestorm in the 2012 election when President Obama uh, took the, the um, Rawlsian position without the Rawlsian cop-out. If you were successful, somebody along the line gave you some help. There was a great teacher somewhere in your life. Somebody helped to create this unbelievable American system that we have that allowed you to thrive. Somebody invested in roads and bridges. If you got a business, that, you didn't build that. Somebody else made that happen. So all hell broke loose. Uh, as you might recall, here's just one of a million ads you could have found in response. To say that Steve Jobs didn't build Apple, that Henry Ford didn't build Ford Motor, to say something like that is not just foolishness, it's insulting to every entrepreneur, every innovator in America, and it's wrong. My father's hands didn't build this company. My hands didn't build this company. My son's team's not building this company. Did somebody else take out the loan on my father's house to finance the equipment? Did somebody else make payroll every week or figure out where it's coming from? President Obama, you're killing us out here. Through hard work and a little bit of luck, we built this business. Why are you demonizing us for it? We are the solution, not the problem. It's time we had somebody who believes in us. Someone who believes that achievement should be rewarded, not punished. We need somebody who believes in America. So it didn't turn out to be Mitt Romney, uh, this, but uh, it is a portent of things to come because um, the, this, this uh, ad was used to reinforce the perception of uh, sort of let them eat cake elites, that he was, you know, sitting there in the comfort uh, of the Oval Office um, saying you didn't build that to, uh, and, and denying the efficacy of the work ethic, uh, of the work ethic. And so you might say uh, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult case to make. Nonetheless, you might have thought, I missed something here, because as Andrew Yang says, not only uh, is he pushing this idea now, but he, he's, he noted that people like um, um, Charles Murray are supporting it. And indeed, um, Milton Friedman has supported a universal basic income uh, since the 1970s. But uh, they have a slightly different thing in mind. So here's Murray's uh, uh, take on it. The basics are this. Uh, at the age of 21, every American uh, starts to receive a monthly deposit electronically to a known bank account of uh, 13,000 uh, divided by 12. 
13,000 is the total basic income of which 3,000 must be devoted to health care. So you have 10,000 of disposable. I think if we simply add that on to the current benefit system, it's not affordable. But what if it replaces everything else? There's no more Medicare, no more health insurance, uh, Social Security. There's no more welfare. There's no more corporate welfare. There's no more agricultural subsidies. I can go through the whole list of transfers. There's none of that stuff, in, and there's also none of the bureaucracies that administer it. You have $10,000, and you say, well, you can't live on $10,000. Well, if you really want to live all by yourself, no, you, you'll probably you'll live a pretty grubby existence on $10,000. You get a minimum wage job, just a minimum wage job, uh, and you work 2,000 uh, hours uh, a year at, uh, let's say, $750. Uh, that's $15,000. Plus ten, that's twenty-five thousand dollars. Yeah, that's well above, way above the poverty poverty line. Well, suppose for some reason you can't work, or just suppose you don't want to work, you can still have a decent existence if you're cooperative. If you're cooperative enough to convince a friend, a girlfriend or boyfriend, a relative or something else to pool your resources, if you just do it with two people, you got twenty. With no working whatsoever, you got 30 if you got three people. You add a little bit of income, and you're in the middle class. That $10,000 given to everyone has a huge effect on their ability to live a decent existence by doing reasonable things. Right now, we claw back benefits at a very low rate. So that if you're on uh, food stamps and Medicare, and you take a job, you, you very soon face a very punitive uh, loss of benefits. I say, look, you keep your entire 10000 We don't claw back a cent of it until you have $30,000 in earned income. So there you have it. The, the conservative case for universal basic income is something that would replace the entire welfare state. And uh, if, you, if you look at the way this has been costed out, uh, the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities in, in Washington, D.C., which is a think tank, estimates that giving everybody a 12,000, he says 13, taking three out for medical care, but it, the $12,000 minimum wage that somebody like Andrew Yang is pushing would cost $3 trillion to fund per year. And, and even if you got rid of Social Security and Medicare, uh, that would not be enough to fund it. And so if you start to think about what would the political coalition for this actually be, it dissolves before your eyes because the AARP would quickly uh, become uh, a, a leader in the opposition to this. You could think about uh, universe, uh, you know, ho hospitals, uh, hospital uh, interest groups and administrators, all kinds of people, uh, public interest groups protecting welfare benefits um, would, would rapidly start to oppose it. And it, it's also worth saying that if you look at where um, there have been efforts to institute universal uh, um, unconditional basic incomes elsewhere, they haven't fared much better. Um, so setting aside something like the Alaska uh, sort of windfall benefit or the, or the Norwegian um, the Norwegian sovereign wealth fund that's been funded by their oil, which is a, is, is a, a different idea. It's a sort of, um, it, it's a, a, sudden, a sudden benefit uh, occurs and the, there's a notion to take, to, to spend it on the whole community, but if you think in general, uh, in Switzerland they had a referendum on a UBI and it went down massively and by the way uh, was uh, strongly opposed by labor unions, uh, as you might suspect if you start to think about it because um, it would erode labor unions bargaining power. In Finland they had a, a modest experiment, uh, selected experiment with UBIs to see what impact it would have and abandon it after a few years. So the notion that uh, even though it might appear that you could get a great deal of support 
for a universal basic income, and it seems like it might not be such a bad idea from a variety of perspectives. I, th I, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a tall order to think your way through a political coalition that could effectively achieve, achieve the kind of universal basic income that most people would want and be will, certainly would be willing to accept. Between the, its sort of frontal assault on the work ethic uh, that many people would regard as uh, necessary to um, uh, get people to be productive uh, and the, the fact that it would replace uh, some of the, the, the policies that Americans are so strongly attached to. I think uh, it, Andrew Yang, there's a good reason why, even though he made it just into the debates, he's not really getting much attention uh, for this view. So I wouldn't buy a lot of stock in it right now. Um, let's talk about minimum wages. Of course, this doesn't help with unemployment, but it certainly uh, would help people who have been victims of long-term wage stagnation. The fight for a $15 an hour minimum wage just netted its biggest victories yet this week. Yesterday, lawmakers in California voted for a bill that will raise the state's minimum wage to $15 by 2022. On Monday, Governor Jerry Brown is expected to sign it into law. Last night, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said he reached a budget deal, hiking the minimum to $15 in New York City by the end of 2018. Suburbs and other other parts of the state would reach that level in 2021. The combined moves could affect as many as 10 million workers. Do you know by today, many of the CEOs of the companies that were fighting to get the minimum wage increased, they have earned as much in the first couple of weeks in January as they will pay these employees for the whole year. That is not justice. That ain't fair, that isn't right. And we don't begrudge anyone their success and their income, but we do begrudge exploitation of the workers uh, to that extent. 90% of Americans have not had a raise for 40 years. Pay your workers a living wage, 15 bucks an hour. It is a fight for fair wages. And so we could find clips of every one of the uh, Democratic candidates now running calling for increases in the minimum wage, at least, at least $15 an hour uh, being phased in or not. Um, so, and, and this has you know, been a, a, a constant theme of American politics that uh, the Democratic Party tends to fight for increased minimum wages and uh, there are efforts, constant efforts to, to increase minimum wage in, at urban, in, within city and, and state legislatures as well. But there are a lot of difficulties with minimum wages as policy when we think it's very easy politics, as you can see, to make that case at least from the perspective of um, the base of the Democratic Party. One question is, well, who actually pays for uh, increases in the minimum wage? It might well be the case that the, co the, the cost of the increased wages is simply passed on in increased prices uh, with the, by the um, uh, companies that uh, have to pay higher wages. And indeed, there was an um, interesting effort uh, to raise minimum wages in Los Angeles a couple of years ago. And we did some interviewing of employers because the local employers association was supporting it. And they, they reasoned two things. Uh, one was uh, the, the money would be spent in their stores in the, in the city, so that it would come back. But, but also that uh, it would be possible to increase prices. So it's not clear who benefits in, in that sense. Um, but more indirectly, uh, if, if you're thinking about what, is, what are the effects going to be on employment, and here we have to think about um, whether 
you'll get higher minimum wages for some at the expense of lower employment in the economy overall. And in some countries, this takes on very extreme forms. In contemporary South Africa, as I think I have mentioned to you, where they have very strong protection of wages in the formal sector, they have extremely high levels of unemployment in the informal and, and, and uh, very different, much lower wages in the informal sector. And furthermore, they, ha they have uh, uh, hemorrhaged jobs to places like Lesotho and textile jobs even to China. And so it, the, there's a real cost, if you like, uh, of increasing minimum wages from the standpoint of employment. And particularly now, when we're thinking about the temptations to go to automation, um, raising minimum wages might have even more deleterious effects on employment. I think I described to you the Nike factory I visited outside Ho Chi Minh City, and one of the notable features of that Nike factory was it was extremely labor intensive. They were using technology that was maybe 30 or 40 years old. But the reason was that wages were low. If you, if you start to ramp up wages, the incentive to send more jobs to robots will become stronger. So the, the, the impulse to improve minimum wages is completely understandable, um, but uh, it has these costs. Moreover, in a federal system like we have here, if you increase minimum wages in one state, um, it, it creates an incentive for uh, employers just to go to other states, just as if uh, you have strong union contracts in one state, such as the auto workers unions in, in Michigan, uh, the, the employers can simply move to uh, Tennessee. Um, so that is a kind of internal race to the bottom problem, and if you have a federal minimum wage, you can avoid that but only at the price of contributing to outsourcing the flying geese problem uh, and so on. In an era when capital is very mobile and can produce things in, in anywhere in the world, propping up minimum wages in one place is, is, you know, water flows around a rock and it's just going to flow somewhere else. So it feels like a uh, stopgap solution. Uh, it's also worth pointing out on the politics front how difficult increasing the minimum wage is. Um, for example, we talked earlier about the estate tax in, in the US. When the estate tax was made permanent in uh, the, the 2013 legislation, the threshold at which you pay it was indexed for inflation, so now it keeps going up. Um, nobody has ever managed to index the minimum wage, and it has, that's why it hasn't been put up for years. There's very powerful resistance, and I think that reflects the, the relative weakness of organized labor uh, in, in getting uh, those, those kinds of things entrenched, if you like. So even if we get, we have a five-year campaign to get the minimum wage to $15 an hour, uh, it probably will have been eroded by inflation by then, and a new campaign will have to be, uh, have to be instituted to uh, get it raised again. The idea of, uh, you know, uh, in 1988, Bill Bradley, when running for the Democratic nomination, uh, ran on the platform of indexing the minimum wage to the median income, got nowhere uh, politically, a very difficult sell. Now, you could say, well, okay, so if there's a race to the bottom, what we need to do is raise the bottom, right? Uh, and so can we think about glo global minimum wage? And th there have been people who have, and even uh, movements, that have committed themselves to this. Um, a man called Sullivan, Sullivan, who was famous for the Sullivan principles uh, applied to American he was a pastor, and Sullivan principles were applied to American corporations doing business in apartheid uh, South Africa. And the Su Sullivan principles were, they tried to force all the multinationals operating in South Africa to say they wouldn't do business in South Africa except on these terms, which uh, defied some of the worst features of apartheid. They were quite successful. 
he's su subsequently got behind various other campaigns to drive up wages in very poor countries. And of course, there's, there's some precedent for this. If you look at the um, ILO, the International Labor Organization, they have created international labor standards. Um, and in, for example, in the 1984 Trade Act, the, fe the federal government said they will not um, trade with countries that don't meet certain labor standards. In the, when uh, the, Bush the Bush senior administration negotiated the NAFTA agreement and then Clinton came in, uh, it's true that he signed, he signed the, the legislation, but not before so-called labor side agreements had been uh, added to, the, to NAFTA, which said that uh, countries had to meet certain minimum uh, wage and labor standards if they were going to uh, trade, sell their products in the US. And so there, there are these efforts, um, and they often involve um, sort of publicity campaigns. There were huge, huge publicity attacks on Nike uh, for their labor practices in sweatshops in Malaysia and elsewhere that actually had a pretty good effect uh, on Nike in jacking up their wages, and, and Nike became an advocate of pushing for increases in global minimum wages. Um, and I, in an earlier book, spent some time exploring the, the prospects for this, but they're very, very difficult to achieve politically, and even in poor countries, they can have deleterious employment effects uh, if the country's sufficiently poor. So it's not, that it's, it's a, it's not that it's a terrible idea, but if you start to think about um, building and sustaining coalitions to, that can be able to do this in an era of highly mobile capital, um, again, it's not an idea that is likely uh, to, to have much effect. And, and certainly if you look at the, the amount by which minimum wages have been increased, uh, as a result of these campaigns in countries uh, in East Asia and Southeast Asia. They, they're uh, minuscule uh, from the perspective of having any effect on American wages. Uh, it's very unlikely that they'll be able to do that. So this is the, the difficulty with, with minimum wages. It's, it's, it's an idea that, that uh, is obviously appealing. It's, very, it's an easy soundbite. You see all these Democratic candidates running on it, but uh, in, in terms of having an actual impact, it seems like it's not going to do very much, and it's certainly not going to affect the stability of employment. So let's talk about the earned income tax credit. Um, this is a much less well known about um, phenomenon, and although ideas of this kind have been around for a long time. Indeed, uh, in, in Britain in the 19th century, there was a poor law system called the Spenumland system, which was essentially a, a subsidy of very low wages to keep people out of poverty. So it's a subsidy to business, um, but it's paid to the worker. Uh, okay, that's how the earned income tax credit works. And uh, interestingly, it was signed into law by President Ford in 1975, although it had begun its life in the Nixon administration, and he had been overtaken by events, but um, <laughs> the, the program survived nonetheless, and it started out very small. So the, the first earned income tax credit worked like this. It, you got a 10% credit for the first $4,000 of your earned income, and it then was phased out after $8,000. So the idea was that if your credit exceeded the amount of tax you owed, the government would write you a check for the difference, right? So this is the idea of the earned income tax credit. That's what economists say it is refundable. Um, that's what a refundable credit means, that if, if it falls below zero, you don't stop getting it. You, the government actually writes you a check for the difference. And so it took a lot of people off the tax rolls entirely, and then people would start to get a check. 
Now you might say, well, the numbers were so small. Um, furthermore, originally it was for single mothers with children only. But here the, we should call back uh, the, the language approximate goals that I talked about um, last time. A very important book um, called The Hidden Welfare State by a man called Christopher Howard was published in 1985 in which he talked about the world of tax expenditures. This is a classic tax expenditure. It's not seen as a transfer payment in the budget. It's called a tax expenditure. It's an expenditure through the tax system, even though the great majority of it is the government actually writing checks to people. It's not tax refunds because of the refundable character of it. Um, so the hidden welfare state is the world of um, tax expenditures. And his book uh, gives chapter and verse of the the little known truth that the hidden welfare state is actually uh, as big as the welfare state, as the visible welfare state, because what tends to happen with tax expenditures is that they start out small and then they grow over time. And so it's a kind of get, don't worry that it's small to begin with, get your foot in the door in the dark, as it were, uh, and then uh, push uh, to open the door further later. Um, and an, an interesting feature is that the, the EITC has had strong bipartisan support from Republican and Democratic administrations and has been expanded numerous times. Um, by, by 2017, it was, it was costing the federal government more than $70 billion in wage subsidies to more than 25 million families, and it doesn't now phase out completely until $50,000, which is above the median income. So uh, it's, you know, 25 million families, you're talking about 100 million people, probably, uh, close to it, uh, are being supported in some measure by the earned income tax credit. They're either getting a tax deduction uh, or they're actually getting a check from the federal government. Now, uh, this, is, this, is, uh, this is not chump change, right? Another feature of it that is very appealing is that it's very cheap to administer. You don't need a new, you don't need a new bureaucracy uh, to administer it. It's administered basically by the IRS, right? You, you, uh, you don't need a whole uh, department of the earned income tax credit. Um, so that's a, a, an additional uh, feature of it. And also, it has a very interesting set of incentives attached to it, which is unlike a minimum wage, which creates the incentive of a race to the bottom, this actually creates an incentive of the race to the top. Because if, if you have state EITCs, as many states do, what's going to happen is if, if you, if you, if the state you know, a particular state offers a better, a more generous EITC than a different state, all else equal, the, the company will move to the state that has the better EITC benefit because it's a wage subsidy. It's a wage subsidy, but it's, it's um, so it's making things cheaper for employers and so it can be a magnet uh, for firms rather than uh, a disincentive for firms to, uh, to move in to your state. So it's, this is a hugely appealing feature of it from the standpoint of uh, avoiding the race to the bottom and on the contrary, creating an opposite incentive. Another desirable feature of it is that while it is a subsidy to the firm, it's paid directly to the worker. And if you think about that rather than, say, if you look at the infrastructure bill that the Congress adopted last year um, with tax breaks for firms that invest in, in uh, infrastructure, you know, the, one of the stock critiques is it's very difficult to make sure they actually make those investments in the infrastructure. They take, you know, they do the planning and R&D and the planning and the money paid to 
consultants, and maybe they do it or maybe they don't. Uh, or if you think about um, place-based incentives to firms to move to, to different areas, there's lots of criticism of them by economists that they, um, that they lead to a lot of clientelism and corruption and so on. Uh, when, when your payment is going straight to the worker, the, the, there's, no, there's a much smaller possibility of that. Now, e economists will still object that this is distorting labor markets, uh, and uh, some people think it's morally obnoxious because it's giving firms incentives to pay lower wages. Uh, uh, and it does give firms incentives to pay lower wages. Nonetheless, you can see the potential here for uh, a coalition. Uh, and indeed, business has tended to like the earned income tax credit. I think that it's one reason why Republicans have tended to get behind it. Uh, and certainly, in the, in the last decade, the increases in the EITC are by far the biggest uh, increase in, in downward redistribution that we have seen uh, at the hands of the federal government. Um, so um, this is, this is uh, I think, genuinely is an idea that as time has come and you should think about uh, the likely expansion of the EIC, T, EITC as a way of um, generating employment uh, and increasing wages that uh, is going to have uh, more rather than less um, of a future. Um, of course, it is the other reason Republicans are willing to get on board with it is that it's linked to work. Uh, there's no, this is unlike the unlike unconditional basic income. You only get it if you actually work. Um, nonetheless, employers can keep wages low knowing that they're going to get the, the subsidy for providing the employment. Um, so I, I want to spend our final few minutes talking about unemployment and adjustment assistance. Uh, again, I think an extremely important set of policies in view of the, um, in, the insecurity of uh, insistence. Now, unemployment insurance in America is a very has a very depressing history. If you go back to the Social Security Act of 1935, there was a lot of talk at that time of creating a national unemployment insurance system uh, based on an, a tax you pay when employed. But there was a, a strong uh, body of opinion that said the Supreme Court would strike it down as unconstitutional for technical reasons that needn't concern us. So instead, what we got was unemployment uh, the, the unemployment system was created as part of the Social Security Act, but essentially as a kind of unfunded mandate on the states. And all the federal government supplied was some guidelines and some uh, administrative support, and in, 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 in particularly extreme circumstances such as the Depression or after the financial crisis, the, gov the federal government will make lump sum contributions to sort of prop up um, unemployment insurance in the states. But basically it's a state-based system. And that immediately has one very bad feature, which is you, state legislators do not want to have uh, very generous unemployment insurance because they worry about the race to them. They don't want to be uh, paying it. And so there's a lot of resistance at the state level. Um, the benefits that they create, uh, state unemployment, they're often very short term. They replace about 40% of prior earnings, and they mostly don't keep people out of poverty. Um, this particularly low coverage for low-income workers. So it's not a good country in which to be unemployed. And indeed, the, the, the short-term character of the support, the hurdles to getting it, um, and the prevalence of longer-term unemployment I was telling you about in an earlier lecture, may mean that in 2016, only about a quarter of the unemployed workers in America were receiving benefits. 
down from over a third um, in 2007. So you see there the effects of the long-term unemployment and the difficulty of getting it. And also another thing that's happening is that more and more long-term unemployment employed workers are just choosing to go on to um, social security disability uh, benefits. Applications for disability insurance have skyrocketed. So they're leaving the workforce permanently. Uh, again, it's a very costly uh, solution um, to, to the problem. And because the wages that are taxed to fund unemployment benefits, the, the, there is a cap. It's also a very regressively financed system. So uh, the unemployment insurance in America has uh, never been robust. It's difficult to get, and it, it's um, uh, failing badly. I think is about the best that you can say of it. But there's a more interesting set of programs that I want to end by spending a little bit of a few minutes talking about. And this, this, is, this is the idea that was known as trade adjustment insurance, trade adjustment assistance. And it was a missed opportunity politically for the, for the, because of the, the way in which uh, it came to be enacted and then uh, implemented. So it was adopted in the Kennedy administration in 1962. This was an era of trade deregulation, uh, not unlike uh, the era in the post-Cold War. And the Kennedy administration really wanted to uh, get trade agreements with other countries to, to improve trade. And they, the unions were a lot stronger then than they are now. And, and the way the administration got the unions to support it was to get behind this idea of trade adjustment assistance. And it was going to be, uh, it was going to be robust unemployment ins insurance coupled with um, funds to support relocation and free retraining. And so um, the AFL-CIO supported it. They supported the, the Free Trade Act uh, on the grounds that this would be uh, the quid for the quo, if you like. Uh, to use the language of the week, um, that the, the, we would start to get this adjustment assistance uh, paid to workers. They would get better unemployment, longer term unemployment support, and they would get support to relocate, and um, they would get uh, free retraining to re enter the workforce in, in, um, in another occupation. It was a huge administrative catastrophe. Uh, President Kennedy um, was assassinated, and when the Johnson administration came in, they had different priorities, and uh, they were doing civil rights, they were doing voting rights, they were preoccupied with the Vietnam War, so they, th this was not a high priority of the administration. And they didn't set up an effective implementing strategy. Uh, for this program. And so throughout the 1960s, actually not a single claim for trade adjustment assistance was actually funded. And uh, business had been very skeptical of this program and had not really supported it. But as the 1960s wore on and the desire for free trade agreements in, uh, in many sectors got stronger, Business decided that they they liked this idea, and um, but by then the AFL CIO had concluded they had been so badly burned that uh, George Meany, who was its head and who had actually championed uh, the idea, he rechristened it burial insurance, and uh, the unions have since opposed all free trade measures, and so it's a really a lost opportunity because it's the one time in American history that American unions had actually been in favor of free trade. And so um, a real lost opportunity. And this is, an, this is a, an idea that has really taken hold in some other countries. The gold standard here is Denmark, um, which supplies 60% uh, of your wage, lost wages for three years, plus huge amounts of retraining. Uh, for workers to re-enter the workforce. Very tailored to individuals. They spend a lot of 
resources on it. And so um, this too is an area where um, we, we argue in wolf, The Wolf at the Door, it's an idea whose time has come. And, but it has to be rethought in the following, uh, the fo I'll just finish with this, it has to be rethought in the following way. Um, one of the problems with it was w that uh, the, the unions had a lot of trouble supporting it, not only because they had thought they had been burned, but they said, why should we only help people who have lost their jobs to trade? Indeed, one of the reasons it was so hard to get it was you had to prove you'd lost your job due to trade rather than for some other reason. They said, that's unfair, because what about industries where people lose jobs that are not due to trade? And indeed, in the Reagan administration, when they decided to essentially underfund the program so much as to effectively kill it, Reagan made exactly the same argument. He said it's arbitrary just to, to uh, help people who've lost jobs to trade. Um, well, in our era, where, where jobs are probably increasingly going to technology, as we have heard about, um, it should be reconceived as universal adjustment assistance, and I think it would be much easier to build and sustain the coalition to protect it. So what business should fear if they don't get behind these kind of proposals is that Andrew Yang will turn out to have been right. Um, <laughs> And just we'll, we'll let, uh, I'll re leave you with this, this uh, epitaph on the 2016 election. And I won't tell you who, who said it until after I've read it to you. Trump's election wasn't about Trump. It was a throbbing middle finger in the face of America's ruling class. It was a gesture of contempt, a howl of rage, the end result of decades of selfish and unwise decisions made by selfish and unwise leaders. Happy countries don't elect Donald Trump president. Desperate ones do. In retrospect, the lesson seems obvious. Ignore voters for long enough and you'll get Donald Trump. Yet the people at whom the message was aimed never received it. Instead of pausing, listening, thinking, and changing, America's ruling class withdrew into a defensive crouch. Beginning on election night, well, that's enough of it. Uh, we're out of time, but it's Tucker Carlson. You might be surprised to know. All right, we will see you after next week.